Welcome to Temple Talk. Rabbi Chaim Richman here together with Yitzhak Ruvain from Jerusalem, Israel today, the 29th day of the month of Tevet, 5778. It's the 16th of January, 2018, and this week, Parshat Bo. And the most important thing of all tonight is Rosh Chodesh, the first of the month, the new moon of the month of Shvat, which of course crescendos with the joyous holiday of Tu B'Shvat, the new year of trees, which this year will be observed on January the 31st. And the month of Shvat is all about renewal and hope and rejuvenation and restarts because the whole concept of, of this month, which is... Um, which is totally epitomized by the crescendo of, of Tu Bishva, is this divine spark of the, the revitalization of the life force, this special divine energy that governs over this month <coughs> that is like a, um, a special time of renewal, both for the natural world and for people as well, if we but avail ourselves of it. So this month, the whole month of Shvat is really a special time for the opportunity for spiritual growth, personal growth, and hopefully we shall be up to that task. Parshat Bo is so amazing because not only because it contains the eighth, ninth, and tenth of the of the plagues, but also because in the very midst of it, uh, there's a break in chapter 12 here in the, in the book of Exodus, and the very first commandment that Israel receives as a nation is given. There in the middle of, of Egypt, in the midst of the, of the darkness of the idolatry and the slavery and the servitude and everything, the Jewish people receive the commandment of Rosh Chodesh, the new month, the sanctification of the new month, just like tonight, is the beginning of the new month of Shvat. It's actually two commandments in one as we examine Chapter 12, where Hashem said to Moshe and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be for you the beginning of the months. It shall be for you the first of the months of the year. And then he goes on and continues giving them the details of the Passover offering so that this really contained two facets, this first verse that we read. The concept of the sanctification of the new moon, which is a central theme and core identity issue of who the people of Israel are in the world that we count the lunar calendar <coughs> and what everything that represents as far as the renewal of the moon every month but also that Nisan is the is from the, a biblical perspective the first of the month we begin counting with Nisan and for all practice and purpose this is like the beginning of time this count that they receive there in Egypt and that has to do with so with so many things, you know, the concept of Rosh Chodesh. We've always talked about how amazing Rosh Chodesh is because all the other um, observances on the Hebrew calendar, on the calendar of the sacred seasons of Hashem, like the Mo'adim, the, the, the special appointed times, whether it's Shabbat or the festivals, the three festivals, <coughs> they are like bringing an illumination into the world um, of something that is a pattern that was set in time, you know, like the Israel left Egypt and Hashem created the world and received the Torah at Mount Sinai. All of these things set a certain kind of refraction of light into the cosmos, and that's why we observe these commandments. However, the commandment of the new moon is completely different because that is kind of like receiving an illumination from the future that hasn't even happened yet completely because we find the prophets tell us that in the future, where Isaiah says, for example, that <coughs> all flesh will come to bow before me every Sabbath and new moon. The idea is that in the rectified world, there'll be a whole different, a whole different um, connection between the whole world, not only on Shabbat, but also Rosh Chodesh and this idea of, of renewal. Anyway, the idea that I want to say now is that the whole connection between <coughs> what's going on in Egypt, the story of the, of the plagues, and the preparation of the going out of Egypt, it fits in so completely perfectly with Rosh Chodesh. So it's not, it's not just like a, a coincidence that this was the first commandment that the community of Israel was given collectively in, um, in Egypt. It took place in the middle of the whole saga of the Exodus. They received the commandment to, re to renew the moon and to sanctify time. I think it's because when when you think about it, the 
everything that Rosh Chodesh represents is the very opposite of what Egypt represents. Because Egypt represents being stuck in one place. Not, when you, I mean, what was going on here? Why did Hashem need ten plagues? You know, we talk about this all the time. Why did He need to bring ten plagues against Pharaoh in Egypt? He, he could have done the whole thing miraculously without any buildup. You know, if He wanted to take Israel out of the house of bondage, it could have been without any drama. <clears throat> it could have been immediate. But first of all, our sages teach us that he wanted to give Pharaoh and the Egyptians a chance to repent. He wanted to give them a chance to really look deeply and see what's going on. But also, it, it had a lot to do with uh, demonstrating that Hashem is in charge of everything, that Hashem is, is um, con in control of the world because the pagan mindset, the idolatrous framework of everything that Egypt was all about, was about total denial. Like we say, denial is a river in Egypt. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist that. D a total denial of Hashem's orchestration of, of everything. And Rosh Chodesh is the opposite of that. Rosh Chodesh is recognizing that, that there is constant renewal, there's constant rebirth, that you, can, you don't have to be of one mindset, you don't have to be stuck. It's, it's like synonymous with repentance. And it's the opposite of, of, of being old, being stale, being, being focused on one thing. If you're, if you're not with Hashem, if you're in denial of Hashem's um, omnipotence and, and uh, divine providence, <coughs> then it's like you're making it up as you go along and everything is just, a, it's very narcissistic and, and it's very self-centered and it's full of denial. <coughs> and this is one of the amazing things about the, one of the early verses in the, in the Parsha, where Hashem said to Moshe, come to Pharaoh, for I have made his heart and the heart of his servant stubborn, so that I can put these signs of mine in his midst. And so you may relate in the ears of your son and your son's son that I made a mockery of Egypt. And in Hebrew, Asher hit alalti b'mitzrayim, that I, kind of like that I was playing, mm -hmm. I, was, I was like messing with, them. messing with Egypt and my signs that I placed among them, that you may know <coughs> that I am Hashem. <coughs> Sorry. And I think that this verse is um, it resonates very very loudly in our ears now as well because this is how Hashem deals with the nations and with and with the world right now also there's a question of a whole lot of of making of, of playing around and and making a mockery and and uh, messing with with uh, world leaders as well but it's all about like getting the world to recognize where everything is coming from that it's all being orchestrated from one source that it's all, that it all means something because because the, the idea of metzarim of the narrow place which is what egypt represents the consciousness of the narrow place is is that it's just this is the way things go it's just mm -hmm. it's just teva it's just nature you can't expect anything and and uh, everything is meaningless and everything that the experience in egypt teaches us is that everything is is very very full of meaning and that's what Jewish history is all about. That's what Rosh Chodesh is all about. So I guess a modern parallel um, in terms of this attitude that this is the way things are, this is the way they've always been, nothing's going to change, and I represent that static quality would be, say, the so-called two-state solution <laughs> or the... Um, the role of the so-called Palestinians as the uh, underdogs and victims, et cetera, et cetera, which is being challenged right now. And uh, a lot of uh, world leaders are having a very hard time, um, just like Pharaoh did, in, uh, in dealing with that. And they seem to be digging themselves in even deeper and deeper, just like Pharaoh did, into their own, their own emda, their own uh, stale and staid and fossilized position and they like Pharaoh if they don't change they will uh, implode or explode however you want to look at it you know it was just a week ago um, today um, last last Tuesday we we recorded Temple Talk <coughs> and we did not mention on that broadcast the murder mm -hmm. of Rabbi Razil Shevach because it actually happened that evening right. um, <coughs> This father of six, who was a very holy Jew, a very wonderful rabbi, educator. Um, he was very active in preparations for the temple as well. 
um, a very special person who was very well beloved was murdered in a drive-by shooting uh, <clears throat> Tuesday, January 9th. And um, that set in motion a, a number of, uh, of um, actions and reactions as well as, as far as what you're speaking mm -hmm. about in this verse, like Hashem saying, I made a mockery of, of Egypt. Um, basically, I just, and I just have a couple of couple of things that I wanted to point out here. Um, Trump's uh, envoy to the Middle East, Jason Greenblatt, mm -hmm. made some sort of a statement that the PA was um, complicit in the murder right. and a, par a partner in the murder because the PA, after all, the Palestinian Authority pays salaries to uh, terrorists and the families of terrorists. It's called pay for, pay for slay, mm -hmm. <laughs> or is it slay for pay? Pay for slay because there's actually like a, gra a graduated um, menu of uh, payments that are made the more Jews that they, that they uh, kill and the more heinous the crime. <clears throat> so he said some sort of a statement in the, in the press that, uh, um, he, that, that, uh, that uh, blamed um, the PA for supporting terrorism. The Palestinian Authority condemned that statement and they were very, very angry. Um, and I'm just looking at the article here. Greenblatt, Greenblatt placed the blame for the attack squarely on Palestinian terrorists and said the Palestinian Arab glorification of murder was hindering peace with Israel. So the, 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 the PA's, quote, foreign ministry blasted that statement and, and, and said these biased American statements represent prejudiced ideological positions that are hostile to the Palestinian people and do not serve the efforts to, res to revive the peace process. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in other words, by pointing out this fact right. that these people r actually receive money that is provided by America and by the European Union in the, as we said last week, wasn't it last week that we mentioned, the figures, millions and millions of dollars a year, that got them very angry. Be and it shows that they're biased because we're actually speaking the truth, just like, we're, just like there's a bias that uh, Trump recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital, mm -hmm. which, is it, which it is. Anyway, that's nothing compared to the reaction of uh, Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the so-called president of the so-called PA, who now basically is finished with America. Mm -hmm. He says that only international mediation could bring him back to the table. He also um, utilized a classic uh, Arabic curse, mm -hmm. and he cursed and Trump's. Trump. What did he say? Trump's house. house. He said, "May May Allah destroy his house." Which uh, I read a. And under uh, the actual meaning of such a curse in the Arabic uh, tradition is that everyone in your family will die, Ouch. should die a horrible, slow, painful death. It's, Ouch. Yeah, it's, it's by house they mean human beings. So he's upset. He's upset. Well, he's upset. He's, and then he uh, gave the speech. He can't change. He gave the speech and uh, in which he categorically dismissed uh, the U.S., but he also gave the speech where he denied any... Jewish connection whatsoever to the Holy Land, and he gave a whole spin. Even denied a Jewish connection to the state of Israel. Right, and he gave a whole <laughs> pseudo pseudo intellectual spin on um, the whole ent enterprise of the state of Israel, which he called a colonial project unrelated to Judaism. Which began with Cromwell. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> was that right. 600, 500 years ago? Right, four hundred. And he began to, to talk about the Holocaust. Of course, he received a degree from a university in Moscow in Holocaust denial, mm -hmm. so he brought that up again. And he began to talk about how European Jews during the Holocaust chose to undergo murder and slaughter over emigration to British-held Palestine, all sorts of things he and began the to say. Israel, the, the new state of Israel had to forcibly bring Jews from Arab countries who didn't want to leave their right. friendly Arab countries. He left out the fact that from 1939 to 1945, the British mandatory authorities prevented almost all Jewish immigration to Palestine at the behest of the Arab states. Mm -hmm. At the behest of the uh, Mufti of right. Jerusalem. In any event, the idea here, or just again, I, I see these two things totally uh, like um, interwoven and like an overlay. Everything that's going on now on, on er, exactly what we're reading in every Torah portion here as far as Hashem kind of taking Pharaoh and taking the people of Egypt and shaking them kind of like grabbing them by the, by the corner of the garment and shaking them and showing them that he's right here. And they're like, no, we, we don't know who he is. We never heard of him. There's nothing going on. So, so um, 
again, the, the world is the same world. The world that is calling upon Israel to um, self-immolate, to give itself up, to disappear, to um, basically give in to terror, something that no nation would do. And in the face of this whole, th this whole scenario that we've just mentioned, that this, that this holy, beautiful man, father of six, was, was murdered, and his, his and, and, and by the way, the, um, the, <clears throat> the Palestinians uh, dismiss this U.S. demand to stop paying t uh, salaries to terrorists. They say that they never will, and that that's their obligation. Mm -hmm. It's like, this is the culture, the culture of, 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 uh, of cursing Trump's uh, house that they should all die. This is the culture. And we're expected to, to um, call these people partners for peace. So one of the amazing things that's going on now, basically across the board, ideologically, in all the parties politically in Israel now, as a result of Abbas's speech before this um, uh, body of, uh, of uh, whoever it was that he spoke Terrorist. to, the Palestinian uh, so-called leadership, one of the reactions in the Israeli public now, <clears throat> both right and left, is that, you know what, it's time to admit that this whole um, fantasy of the two-state the two state solution really is dead. There's nobody to talk to. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, that is a, a huge um, revelation to a lot of people, maybe not to us, but it's like he's been exposed because he was considered to be the moderate. I don't know why. Yeah, He was actually an arch-terrorist himself, but it's like... Maybe we could, we're finally gaining a little bit of sanity here, and people are beginning to realize that, th that this, is, this is not the peace that we want, like to, we, that we could have the audacity, the holy audacity to admit, we, we, you know what, we don't want peace, if that's what peace is. We want our land. We want security for our, for our children. We want to be able to live our lives. This goes back to the Parsha again. I mean, maybe the ten plagues were not just to give uh, Pharaoh a chance to to uh, straighten out, but maybe the uh, Israelites uh, took 10 plagues before it finally got into their heads that they had no place in Egypt and they had Except to get out. Except that you're, that you're uh, alluding to the scariest uh, part of, uh, of the whole story of the exodus from Egypt, which is that w only one-fifth of all the Israelites even left Egypt. Right. Because yeah, scary, because right? four-fifths of them, were w they just refused. They refused to recognize... Hashem himself, they, they, and they died during the plague of darkness because mm -hmm. they were not interested in uh, coming out of Egypt. They wanted to stay there. Yeah. So, uh, so took, who do we call them? Till this Should long, I get myself took, into deep hot water and call them Democrats? It took 20, 23, 24 years, 25 years now of Oslo um, before, which has been plagued by, by terror and murder from the very first day. It's taken 25 years for everybody to get on board and finally say, this is, this is finished, this is a farce. It takes people time, Rabbi. That's why God put us in charge of time. Give, make us responsible for ourselves. That's such a beautiful idea. Um, <clears throat> so this is how it looks at this point. In the meantime, um, we have had occasion uh, from time to time to, to, to talk about this whole, this whole um, illusion of the Palestinian people. And <clears throat> this is as good a, a good a time as, uh, as it has been to remind uh, everybody of the, the quotation by the PLO executive committee member Zahir Moussen in a 1977 interview with the Dutch newspaper Trouw, in which he stated, there is no such thing as the Palestinian people. Mm -hmm. It is just an Arab tactic for the destruction of Israel. This is f really pretty important for people to be aware of since the whole world is pressing Israel to um, accept the Palestinian um, capital of Jerusalem, to accept Palestinian nationalism and aspirations, and to admit that there are, that there are two peoples here, and that's why there have to, has to be a two-state solution. And to accept uh, 50,000 years of Palestinian history. History, even though, as we pointed out, uh, um, Jack Englard's article that the Beatles are actually older <laughs> than the Palestinians, because they were only ratified by the Arab League in 1964, Four, I think it was. Yeah. So here's Zahir Moussin, Zahir Moussin, who was uh, on the PLO Executive Committee. He actually 
stated, there is no such thing as the Palestinian people, just an Arab tactic for the destruction of Israel. And here's the qu whole quotation. He said, the Palestinian people does not exist. The creation of a Palestinian state is only a means for continuing our struggle against the state of Israel for our Arab unity. In reality, today, there is no difference between Jordanians, Palestinians, Syrians, and Lebanese. Only for political and tactical reasons do we speak today about the existence of a Palestinian people. Since Arab national interests demand that we posit the existence of a distinct Palestinian people to oppose Zionism. For tactical reasons, Jordan, which is a sovereign state with defined borders, cannot raise claims to Haifa and Jaffa. Well, as a Palestinian, I can undoubtedly demand Haifa, Jaffa, Beersheba, and Jerusalem. However, the moment we reclaim our right to all of Palestine, we will not even wait a minute to unite Palestine and Jordan, which, by the way, Abbas is always talking about. He says it's one people living in two states. He says this all the time. It's one people living in two states, and that, and that um, there's no difference between Palestinians and Jordanians. And in fact, the Hamas foreign minister said the same thing. He said, personally, half my family is Egyptian. We are all like that. More than 30 families in the Gaza Strip are called al-Matsri, which mm -hmm. means Egyptian. Brothers, half of the Palestinians are Egyptians, and the other half are Saudis. And then, of course, in 1970, Arafat declared, our basic aim is to liberate the land from the Mediterranean Sea to the Jordan River. We are not concerned with what took place in June 1967 or in eliminating the consequences of the June War. The Palestinian Revolution's basic concern is the uprooting of the Zionist entity from our land and liberating it. So this is about all, all about the Palestinians who became an ancient civilization dating back 50,000 years on June 2nd, 1964, mm -hmm. That's owing, to the, owing to their being legitimized by the Arab League. <coughs> and so this is, this is exactly who we're up against. So I see many parallels in, in the whole cycle of denial just like, just like Paro was denying the God of Israel and the Jewish people's right to exist, basically, so also these, these so-called Palestinians, which is the entire Arab world, is denying any Jewish connection whatsoever to the land of Israel. But just like, uh, as we'll learn in the parasha, it was up to the Israelites to finally uh, take their own fate into their own hands do what they had to do to get out. It's the same way today. We have to do what we need to do to break the cycle. Amen. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Temple Talk. day of the month of Tevet, 5778, January 16th, 2018, tonight is Rosh Chodesh, Shvat, first day of the new month of Shvat, meaning it's a brand new moon, and of course, recognizing the brand new moon is the first commandment that we received as a people while still in Egypt, which Rabbi mentioned earlier. You know, this parsha, Rabbi, after the plagues, after the nine plagues, and after God says, commands Israel to mark uh, the new moon, correct? Then we get our instructions for the Pesach, for the, for the Korban Pesach, the Passover offering, which we all needed to offer there in Egypt. And, you know, God at the very beginning of this whole saga, when he first uh, met with Moshe and last week's parsha, when Moshe came back to him very despondent and said, you know, I tried and it was a big failure. Pharaoh just laughed and made the task for the Hebrew slaves even more difficult to accomplish. And now everybody's mad at me. And God said, you know, I am the God of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. And I've heard their cries. And now I feel with the Passover offering, God saying, you know what, I heard their cries, 
and I performed ten or now up till now nine different makot, nine different plagues, and I've showed you that I mean business. He showed Egypt as well, but he showed the Israelites that he means business. And now God is saying to Israel, now it's your turn. I remember that I'm the God of Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Now do you remember that you're his children? Now it's your turn to be as bold and as brave as they all were and to do this Karban Pesach because basically that was God's covenant with Avraham uh, at the Akedah, at the binding of Isaac, that that you will do a Korban Pesach, you will, do, you will make an offering. That's how you express your commitment to me, God. And now you're going to react that commitment by doing a Korban Pesach. It's not at Har Moriah, it's not in the place of the Holy Temple, it's here in Egypt. But uh, I feel that God is saying to Israel now, I've done my part and now you're never going to get out of here unless you you know, do your part and show me that you're part of this equation, part of this covenant, and then you'll get out of here. And it's all a prelude to the building of the Holy Temple. This is why the, all of this is happening. This is, as we're going to learn in Parashat B'Shalach at the Song of the Sea, you have you brought them in and placed them in the, mountains of, in the mm-hmm. mountain of your inheritance. The whole, that verse teaches us that the whole purpose of leaving Egypt was just to come into the land of Israel <coughs> to build the Holy Temple. Because that is the antithesis of everything that's going on in Egypt. Again, the, 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 the stuck-in-time staleness of idolatrous um, mindset, of everything just being happenstance, and of everything just being the way it is, and, uh, and, uh, and um, the denial of Hashem being in control of everything, is what is, is, what is totally um, you know, shattered every day in the Holy Temple where the relationship between God and man is so emphasized of how much we are uh, in Hashem's hands and how we have to recognize that every breath we take is, is uh, His kindness. And the Holy Temple being the right place and the right time every day, as opposed to Egypt, which was the wrong place, and it was always the wrong time in Egypt, which is why the first thing we had to do was to reset the clock and recognize the the month, and from the moment that time started working uh, in the right direction, then we could get ourselves out of there and get back into the right place, which is here in the land of Israel, Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, the Holy Temple. And don't forget also that we went in to Egypt as shepherds, uh, despite the fact that uh, shepherding was a profession that the Egyptians uh, we're disgusted by, and we're leaving as shepherds. We're leaving with our with our flocks. We're leaving with the with the korban pesach, with the offering, and we're going out as very proud Israelites, uh, the same way that we originally went in. And uh, I think that's a big part of making the move out. It wasn't just a physical act of of the the offering, but it was a whole new mindset where we are returning to ourselves, we're going to have the same pitas, the same flatbreads, and the same lamb that we had before we went into Egypt, and uh, we're going out now in control of time under our own schedule, and uh, that's it. We're leaving Did you behind. say in control of time? Under the control. Or under the control of time. Under the control, or, or in, control in control of, of time. time. Yeah, in control of time. I think one of the amazing things about the juxtaposition of giving the commandment of Rosh Chodesh a.k.a. the month of Nisan, a.k.a. The, the, the sanctification of the new moon, in this parsha of Bo, with the last three plagues, the whole idea being that it's like, are you controlled by time or are you in control of time? Are you, are you a, a slave of time? Are you imprisoned and trapped by time? Or are you a master of time? Mm-hmm. And when we were slaves in Egypt, we were imprisoned not only by... Uh, by Pharaoh and the Egyptians, and not only by the by the servitude, but by the mindset. In fact, every everywhere that our sages teach deep lessons about the Egyptian slavery, they emphasize the psychological aspect mm-hmm. of how it was this slave mindset, and how we were so browbeaten with by by the by the psychological warfare 
of, of uh, Pharaoh, who, by the way, metaphorically, is compared to the Yitzhahara himself. You know, the sages always play that game where they, they even say, they even say, who learned from who? Who was first, like the evil inclination or Pharaoh? Because mm -hmm. they employ the same kind of tactics against a person, which is basically to sink into this despair of thinking that every day is going to be the same thing. I have the same rote, the same work to do, the same slavery, and I'll never get out of this. And that's why <coughs> the introduction in this in this week's portion of Rosh Chodesh, and tonight actually being Rosh Chodesh, and especially the month of Shva, of, uh, of Shva, which is tonight, even though here the Pasuk in the, the verse in the beginning of chapter 12 is talking about the first month, which is Nisan. That's why it all is, is so perfect and it fits together so well. Because um, the, the theme of this month of Shva is that there is going to be um, hope at the end of the, mm -hmm. the light at the end of the tunnel. You know, here we are in the midst of, of, of the winter. But there is something about this month that is, that bespeaks a divine flow of energy that permeates and reverberates throughout the whole fabric of creation and again comes to its comes to its climax on the 15th day of Shvat where there's some sort of like life force call it a sap call it a call it a a, um, a like a, a elixir of eternal youth that that is flowing through all of creation and promises this renewal and and uh, our sages emphasize that this is speaking about a person not just about every tree and every blade of grass you know there's a verse in deuteronomy it says for is a man a tree of the field and it's and it's rhetorical but the idea is there is a comparison between a man and a tree <laughs> and so this idea of the, the rosh hashanah the new year of trees applies to people as well and it is um, um, a call to us beckoning that we we have to break out of our mental slavery. What is the line? <laughs> you uh, know? Yeah, uh, Bob Marley. Yeah. Who knows the line? Uh, uh, anybody here know the line? Uh, no one. None but ourselves can free our minds. Yeah. And the idea is that y there's this divine flow which is reaching the world during the month of Shvat, <clears throat> but you have to avail yourself of it. And that, and interestingly. The other thing about the month of Shvat is that this is the time <coughs> that Moshe Rabbeinu, that Moses was was um, saying over the whole book of Deuteronomy, right? Mm -hmm. The seven weeks right. leading up to his death on the seventh of Adar, beginning on Rosh Chodesh Shvat tonight, is the beginning of the recitation that Moses. It's right there in the first verses of Deuteronomy. He began on Rosh Chodesh Not Shvat. Not seven weeks. Uh, five weeks. Five, Thirty-seven days. Right. Five weeks. Exactly. That he, that he began to gently chastise and bless and teach the people of Israel, preparing them to enter into the land with the book of Deuteronomy. Mm -hmm. And that's why uh, the astrological constellation of the month of Shva is Aquarius, mm -hmm. the bucket. Because the idea is that, the, that the, the words of Torah are being poured out into our hearts, into our souls. This month, it's like the bucket is like, is like uh, overturned, and it's just flowing. However, it's not automatic. Just like everything in life, if you want, it, w the the Torah, you know, this, this theme of Shva is Torah knowledge, Torah study. It's being made available. Moshe is like it's like he's standing with us right now, like speaking to us. But these are the these are the keys to becoming a, a better person, to working on ourselves, to become the people that we can be the better. But it's it's not automatic. Everything is about how hard we're we're going to work. So these these themes they're all back to back: newness, renewal, rejuvenation, um, the, allowing the Torah to permeate into our into fabric of our being, so that we can grow, and sh and and shaking off the shackles of the idolatrous mindset, which is that we're victims of time, that we're victims, and becoming instead masters of time, being able to sanctify time. That that tremendous privilege that God gives us in Exodus 12 of this shall be for you the first of the months. It's like you, you are now in charge of your time, which is the opposite of the slave menta mentality. And of course, we always read these parsiot about Yitzhak Mitzrayim, the Exodus from Egypt, uh, during the month of Shvat. And we oftentimes, are, uh, every year I would say, the, the upcoming, uh, in two weeks, when we read about uh, uh, the crossing of the Red Sea, 
of the Sea of Reeds um, that always uh, uh, falls in very close proximity to to Tubishvat, which is the height of the what you were describing before, the height of the flow of this spiritual flow that rejuvenates all of the world um, on Tu B'Shvat in the, in the 15th of the month of Shvat and um, beckons toward the, the upcoming spring. And of course, that was the crossing of the Sea of Reeds was really the final physical emergence and separation from, from Egypt and uh, all the slavery that that... <coughs> uh, that that embodied and personified. But the personification of slavery in, in modern terms is to be a slave to uh, <coughs> to ourselves, really. Mm -hmm. And and this, the, the despair of modern man, with all of our technology, it's like everything becomes commonplace. We become desensitized to the significance of, of living every day. <laughs> and we've spoken about this so much, but the it, 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 but get get it. I never tire of <laughs> speaking of this. That the greatest danger to spiritual development and the and the and w one of the greatest enemies that we face in our service of Hashem is complacency. Is when things become rote and boring and old and stale. And that's again what Egypt represents. And, and uh, the mindset that Pharaoh was trying to foist upon the people of Israel is that you're, not, you're never going to get out of here and nothing's ever going to change because there isn't any purpose in the universe. And that's the very opposite of what Israel stands for. Which, by the way, is the same tactic that our enemies use against us today, whether it's the uh, Palestinians who try to beat us into some kind of, of uh, a lethargy via terror where it's never going to change you know even if we just remind you once a week that we're there killing people you're just going to eventually give up hope and uh, and uh, sink into this slavery where you feel like you're no longer in charge um and which is that, exactly if I, if I may where the israeli left is coming from mm -hmm. yeah the israeli left is 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 um is basically colored by despair they will not do the Korban Pesach. They will be the 80% <laughs> of, uh, of, of Jewry. Ex that, uh, <coughs> except that now with, with um, Abbas's reaction to the murder of, of Rabbi Shevach and with his rea continued reaction to Trump's announcement and with his continu continued intransigence and cursing uh, Trump and, and saying that he's not interested in anything, uh, maybe that it's a little bit of a wake-up call to, for them maybe, to see. Maybe, but I, I did happen to see today in that uh, uh, bastion of, of uh, leftist, oh, no. self-defeating extremism, uh, Haaretz, an article um, really blasting Abbas for what he said, but saying, so Israel can't become complacent now because someday, because if Israel just goes ahead and, you know, builds and populates the area with Jews... Etc. Etc. Then someday, a real Palestinian leader is going to arise, and then we're going to be in trouble because we'll have really screwed things so up. They're still waiting for the real Palestinian. They're waiting leader. for their Palestinian the Messiah. Yeah. So did I mention that last night, uh, uh, some is a thousand Israeli visitors, uh, worshippers, um, um, entered uh, Joseph's tomb mm -hmm. in um, the city of Shechem in the Shomron in in Samaria. And of course, uh, this happens every so often that the army gives permission. You have to understand that Joseph's tomb, which is one of the most holy places in Israel, which is, which is found in this uh, ho very hostile town of Shechem, uh, you, you need special permission from the army and coordination to be able to go there to pray. So there was a huge gathering uh, of Jews that went to pray at, at Joseph's tomb, a thousand, and it was secured by the IDF. And during the visit, you know what happened? IDF uncovered a... Uh, a bomb. They uncovered bomb, uh, a, a mobile phone yeah. that was... that was um, uh, It was a mobile-operated explosive device. It was found near the tomb, and a bomb squad found it. And they carried out the controlled explosion. And then, of course, as the forces entered and as the buses left the tomb, uh, the buses were stoned and they were damaged, but nobody was hurt. But the idea is, again... You, you got you got a bunch of Jews that are going to pray at the tomb of Joseph, our father, and they set a bomb there. 
And then Haaretz is going to talk about how one day there's going to be a, a Palestinian that's going to rise up and he's going to mm-hmm. be a peaceful leader. And this is the peace partner. And yeah, I've got to tell you one more thing about this whole juxtaposition of everything that's going on today and everything that we're reading about in, in the Parsha, which it just struck me, okay? So the Jewish people in Egypt are the workforce. And they have to gather the straw and they're building these storage cities, which is basically, according to the sages, just to keep them busy. Mm-hmm. At this point, there's not a lot to store. It's about, you know, keeping them uh, occupied and working them to death. They're like, like forced labor camps, and they're building these, these cities, right? So right now, there's a, there's a, a, a fairly um, fantastic building project that's going on here in Israel. I'm referring to what's being uh, touted as the, um, the final, um, the, the final, the final um, solution, if I may say, mm-hmm. to the problem of the tunnels that are being dug constantly by mm-hmm. terrorists from Gaza to infiltrate into Israel to kidnap and murder Israelis. This is a problem that's been going on a long time. We had a war over it. Right. They dig these tunnels, and um, while the world uh, cries about how Israel blockades Gaza, and we don't allow humanitarian um, uh, materials and building materials, and then Israel lifts the blockade and allows them to, to get all this concrete. And instead of using it for what they need, which is hospitals and schools, they use it to build these, t- these terror tunnels, right? So it's been a constant problem, but now um, Israel came up with some sort of genius solution. They're not saying a, a tremendous amount about it, but there was a little piece that I did catch, a little... A little um, a little clip that showed basically they're they're building this huge subterranean wall that mm-hmm. they're sinking deep in the ground, 65 kilometers long, all along the border with Gaza, and it's going to be and it's going to be um, augmented by um, sensors and all sorts of mm-hmm. all sorts of sophisticated electronic uh, equipment. But this is a this is uh, I, I don't know it goes many tens of meters into the ground. This huge thick reinforced concrete wall which is costing something like four million shekels. What mm-hmm. would that be in dollars? Not that much, a million something. And it's, it's uh, be apparently being b- c- completed very, very quickly. quickly yeah. And they're so enthusiastic about it, the security forces, that they're saying this is absolutely going to destroy the threat of the tunnels um, completely. It's not going to be possible to get past this, this barrier. Mm-hmm. So I just was picturing in my mind, you know, like the like the uh, the labor force, you know, like working with these materials, like building this wall, which is basically. To, I'm not saying it in such a positive way because mm-hmm. it's like it's kind of like going from one slave mentality to another in right. a way. Because then we were servants of Pharaoh, who was the Eight Sahara, who was the master of time, who was keeping us down. And now again, instead of actually direct directly relating to a problem, right. the problem right. of these people, which is an existential threat to the survival of the state of Israel and the Jewish people, who, who have nothing in their plans for us except death and destruction, who set a bomb in Joseph's tomb, who who are angry now and boycotting Trump because he had the nerve to say that Jerusalem is our capital and, he had, and because his advisor had the nerve to say that, that um, they're paying for, for uh, Raziel Shabach's murderer and that, that shows that they're biased against the Palestinians, right? Mm-hmm. And what are we doing? In the, in the heart of our, own, of our own land, we have to erect a barrier to protect ourselves. Right. So it's a, it's, it's a little bit ironic. Yeah, and... Uh, very sad. Not not a positive way. We're about to close up, finish the show, Rabbi. But, but we've we been a, remiss. We have a couple of guests here. Yes, we haven't. We and haven't I think we have to give yet. them the floor and uh, that we have, shout out. We have two uh, wonderful friends from Lubbock, Texas, that are here as uh, observers. Not UN observers, but <laughs> just uh, South Plains Break Center uh, observers of Temple Talk as it's being recorded. I've been very nervous throughout this broadcast. I haven't been myself. But they're here, and I think that they want to call out maybe to their friends. And so it's uh, Chandler and Hayden. Chandler. What do you have to say to the folks back home? Hello to everybody back home, back in Lubbock. Uh, we're having a great time here, and it's awesome to see. It's awesome to listen to this broadcast also. Uh, this place is beautiful. Uh, love this place so far. First time here. And uh, shout out to family back home. Miss you guys. And listeners, you too could uh, get a special ticket to come to the uh, <laughs> undisclosed location of Temple Whoa. Talk to the uh, Studio Slow B down in, there, the, Rabbi. in the Abernathy building. Slow down there. Well, uh, 
I think we should let these guys talk a little more. And I'll give you a cue, and then you can say, uh, thanks for being with us, Temple Talk, because that's how we close the show. Okay, so you keep talking. I'll give you the cue when I hear the music. Say something, guys. Uh, so... So like <laughs> it's it's not easy being me, is it? No, it's not easy being you guys. It's a, it's a very <laughs> See where we go I through. Know. Yeah, yeah, I know exactly. Well, your folks will be real proud to hear you on Temple Talk. I'm sure yeah. of that. I hope okay. you won't need police protection after this. Oh no, oh, it's gonna be. We've mobs. been through worse. Like, you remember the you remember what I'm to say when I give you the cue? Autograph down. Thanks for being with us, Temple Talk. Okay, yeah. it's coming up any second now. Hold on. Okay. We're just waiting a few seconds here. You'll say it together, nice and loud, so everybody can hear. Okay. Wait, I'll count down this here. This is taking too long. This is just taking too long. We're going to lose our whole listener base. Uh, no, no, this is a lot of suspense here. This is the best stuff. Here we go, music. Thanks for being with us, Temple Talk. Awesome.